Awesome. Um, hi, guys. Welcome to another Product School Talk. I'm Cassandra from Product School. Uh, we teach product management, coding, and data at our 14 campuses. Um, before I introduce our guest, I want to make sure you guys can see and hear me. So um, let's go ahead and type in book to get a free copy of the product book. And if you guys already have a copy, feel free to say hello or tag a friend <laughs> that you think would enjoy the talk uh, as well. guys can see and hear me so awesome so it looks like we are <laughs> we're all set um good so today's guest works at a really cool company um many of us are know pretty well um i'd like to welcome fawn q uh product manager at spotify hi fawn how are you doing today hi everyone i'm fawn and um as cassandra mentioned i'm currently a product manager at spotify Awesome. Well, thanks for being here today. I know you have a presentation uh, set up for us, so I'll give you a couple seconds to, sure. to screen share. Um, while she's setting that up, guys, as you know, after the presentation, we're going to take questions, so you can type those in the comments section right after her, um, her talk. So it looks like we're all set. I'll, uh, I'll let you take it from here. Sure. Thanks. Um, so today I'll talk about how to launch a new product or feature. Um, I'll first start with a little bit about my background and kind of my journey to the product manager role. And then I'll go over a few of the new products I've de developed while I was working at Sesame Street and then Amazon. And then talk a little bit about my current work at Spotify, which is mainly around new feature development. Um, so getting started, my uh, kind of background in uh, product management. I've started um, kind of as a research assistant because of my, that was kind of my first exposure to product management through working on this um, online web product called Scratch, which is a visual learning tool for coding. So basically you can go on to this website and then learn how to code, um, but it's all using, using visual blocks and specifically it's for like children or um, teenagers who are learning code. Um, so when I was working there, I didn't really know that what I was doing was uh, somewhat of a project, what, what a product manager would do, which is kind of ma managing the timeline of the product, also conducting a lot of user research, gathering feedback, and sending that to um, kind of the uh, PhD students and the researchers and professors at um, MIT, and so they can kind of distill those feedback into the product. And then naturally, I, after I graduated, I then uh, started working at Sesame Street um, in their digital media department, where they focus a lot on developing a uh, new product uh, for uh, toddlers um, for edu in the educational sector. And then um, I first started as a business development in business development department, and then gradually from one of the project I was working on, um, kind of changed role into a more of a product development role. And then uh, kind of saw the launch of a, this product called Sesame Street Go from ideation all the way to launch. It's a video and game subscription service on iOS, Android, and web. And it's actually now renamed to be just Sesame Street. Um, and then after that, I was really interested in education from these past experiences. Um, heard about a great opportunity at Amazon. Um, they were trying to launch a new product called Amazon English. Um, it's an English learning tool. Um, English is also my second language, so I, that had like a lot of personal connection to me. So I wanted to create an application that helped um, uh, people to learn English. And specifically the target was um, first in Japan and then rest of the Asia after. And after that, I moved on to my current role at Spotify. Um, I'm part of a um, team called App Integrations in the San Francisco office, and we mainly focus on sharing experiences on third-party platforms and integration with um, other applications. Basically, how you view Spotify or how you use Spotify outside of Spotify. Um, so I'll kind of get started by talking about my first product, real product experience at Sesame Street. Um, when, I, when we were first looking at this, um, even thinking about like why should we even develop this application called Sesame Street Go before it even became a product idea, we saw a few customer problems. Um, first was that we saw our customers at, who were parents and kids viewing Sesame Street just had a change of habit when the iPhone, iPad launched um, and linear TV simply did not really meet parents' need. And then toddlers also didn't have a convenient, safe and ad-free way to consume 
Sesame Street content. And this was kind of before um, YouTube Kids or a lot of like um, the uh, kids specific video streaming service were also available. At the same time, for Sesame Street, there was um, lot, a lack of data um, in terms of like what um, types of content that user liked, um, what is our user behavior, has their taste changed over time, and a lot of times we were creating content based on um, use, like, kind of user research, but um, or more on intuition and just expertise, but less on data. And we really wanted to be able to kind of have a better gauge and access to um, our data and users viewing behavior. So um, one idea we had, which later became this application is called um, Sesame Street Go. And we decided to kind of make episodes available to parents and kids on the go through an app and also kind of create a sustainable business model that would um, allow us to continue to engage and retain users um, on a one-to-one -one basis versus like through television or through um, channels like Netflix or Hulu. So we first um, launched this product, um, wanted to kind of test like if this concept even would work and if users even want a standalone streaming application for just Sesame Street content. So we launched a beta website that was, um, you know, pretty, um, uh, pretty like lean in terms of features. Um, we had a gate where we describe what the product is and then um, it's what you see on the screen here. And then after user signs in, they kind of get access to um, hundreds of episodes, like about a hundred episodes. Um, of Sesame Street content, um, but then even though this product was pretty lean, kind of gave us an idea of like just to gauge interest level and what some pain points user have while user uh, while they use this product. Um, we saw a lot of like um, funnel drop off when we first launched this website, especially from this screen to actually consuming the content. So we did a lot of A/B tests, kind of changing. Um, the call to action, changing um, the copy, and also we eventually um, even added a video describing what the product is. Um, but then even though we got like additional um, increase in conversion, the, the, I think the, com the number of the increase was still pretty incremental versus like what we were, our goal was. So we saw the biggest drop off happen on this landing page and also registration page. And we saw the easiest way to kind of remove this gate is to actually remove the landing page and registration page and then create an experience where the user can see the content right away. So on this screen, um, instead of the screen before where you can't really experience the full product, here you can actually, this will become kind of the new landing page where user can just go and then click on a video and be able to play right away versus all the steps you have to do uh, before to get to this step. Um, also, as we launched this beta test, we also started kind of experimenting with um, um, user testing, customer feedback, and then just looking at our engagement data, it really kind of helped us understand, um, uh, you know, what features we should develop next and also um, how, we should, how we should kind of like uh, surface these features to our users. So for example, we had originally had a hypothesis of that when users are um, using our app, they're actually having a co-viewing experience where the parents and the child were watching at the same time. And then through kind of just customer feedback and user testing, we realized that's not true. So we kind of created a separate parent section. And we also noticed that um, kind of season and title-based browsing experience which did not really serve the needs of kids. So we kind of changed um, our browse experience are completely just character based. And then also as we were looking at our engagement data, the average session time was about 15 minutes while each episode of our content was around 50 minutes. Um, so then we started actually dissecting a lot of our episodes into more short form content, form content to kind of um, uh, really adjust to the viewing habit of our users. And then a lot of new features like recently watched and favorite were also things that we observed from just user testing and then customer feedback. And then also um, another thing I want to talk about is that um, the new features that we will build um, and how you maybe prioritize really depending on the goal that you set for your product at a particular time. Um, for example, when we first launched this product, our 
goal was really to increase our acquisition number and increase our free user, paid user, and new user account. Um, and in order to do that, we kind of created this free user experience where you don't even have to have an account to watch a video, but then once you reach, um, once we notice that you watched five videos or six videos, then we kind of still uh, start to upsell you on the paid experience. And then if, if similarly, if our goal was to engage our user, we want them to stay on our platform longer, come back more frequently, uh, watch our video longer, um, we started adding new content types such as games and music videos. Especially games, we saw a lot more longer engagement time with kids. Um, and music video just adds like a new content type that user um, can engage versus, for example, instead of going, um, watching an episode here and then watching a music video on YouTube, they can just stay in our app longer and watch the music video there. And then um, as we, the product becomes more mature and as we think about monetization, we think about how do we convert our free user to paid user. And actually one of the most successful things we did that in converting for each paid user was to decrease the number of free videos. Um, and then we really had to kind of experiment like how, how does like reducing one video affect our um, free user experience so that it's still good, but also um, give a boost to um, that free to paid conversion. And when it comes to retention, it's really about um, giving user win back offers or keeping a newsletter to keep parents engaged, um, to keep topics relevant to our users and always updating the content. And then here I share a little bit about um, kind of just the timeline. We started with a beta web launch, which is pretty common to kind of set user expectations on, um, you know, this is still a beta website. There's a lot of changes, there might be bugs. Um, and then once everything is um, fixed and we feel confident that this is a good product, then we can launch, have a full launch on iOS, Android web. And then eventually we also launch on additional platforms um, such as smart TV and Chromecast. And then when I worked at um, Amazon, uh, we, um, I mentioned a little bit, the product is an English learning product for um, Japanese users. And the customer problem we're trying to solve was really to help um, users develop confidence in English, um, but also um, hear um, English content um, in a very native format. A lot of times when Japanese users are learning uh, English in Japan, um, there's often uh, accent or um, they're not really, you can't really ensure the quality of content that you're getting or English learning that you're getting. Um, also at the same time at Amazon, there's um, this product called Kindle. There's also a product called um, Audible. And there's this technology that we developed where user can listen to an audiobook at the same time while they're reading. And then um, the app will highlight um, the entire content for users. And we found this to be a really incredible tool for um, people who are learning uh, English. Um, so we wanted to kind of leverage this for a new audience. And then we product, the product we created was basically a browse experience um, of um, a lot of the content that we curated specifically for English language learners. And then also a listening experience where user can um, follow along um, to a book they selected, um, reading it, but also listening to how it's pronounced at the same time. And there's a lot of educational tool we created such as ability to um, tap on board to get the um, definition and then um, also um, serve user a quiz after so they could test their understanding and comprehension of the content. I think the most challenging aspect of this um, project was really figuring out the level of content to serve to our users. So we started with a top of funnel um, uh, kind of user survey where, where we're asking what their English level is, um, how they feel, but also um, getting their test score that almost um, most of our user would take. And then based on that test score, we serve content that is right at their English level. And then um, all, we also have a filter section where a uh, user can uh, filter content based on their level of interest and as well as um, uh, the uh, um, the English speaking level that they feel comfortable at. And then I'm gonna quickly skip over this slide, um, but then going over to a little bit of our product launch timeline. Um, we, we took a little bit different approach than what I did at um, Sesame Street. So because this was a new market for us, we first tested um, 
this product at, with all of Amazon Japan's employees. So we did an employee only beta, got some feedback, made some changes, and then we had an invite only launch um, uh, specific to a group of users we identify as they're very interested in learning English. And we, um, and we thought like by kind of identifying these group of users and sending this product to them, we can kind of get more learning from them, not just from the internal employees who might be a little bit biased because they work for a company that the product um, is created for. And then I'll jump to a little bit about my current work at Spotify. Um, so Spotify has been around for uh, many years now. So a lot of the work we do are um, testing new features or making changes and improving new features. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about two features I've worked on recently. Um, we, this year, we kind of revamped our share flow. We had an old share flow where um, had a little bit confusing copy, like when you want to share a song, it says post to or send to, and then based on what uh, you tap on, it, it, it kind of leads you to different sharing destinations. So we wanted to kind of reduce the friction and confusion on that experience. So we came up with like two options that we wanted to um, kind of replace this old experience. And then the new one is version one, is where you can see most of the destinations um, line by line, and then you can uh, surface all of them. Um, but then um, each of the destination is a little bit smaller. And the, the other version, which is a version two, has kind of more prominent buttons and more prominent sharing call to action. So we thought maybe, you know, both have different um, uh, hype, like both have different elements that we, UI that we think would drive users to share more, but then we really wasn't sure which one would be better. So we actually ran an A-B test, test both like version one and version two. That's like the second screenshot and the third screenshots that you see on this page. Um, and then based on those results, we decided to kind of go with uh, uh, the version one, which led to more conversion for us in terms of successful sharing rate. And then another, um, uh, features we launched recently was um, uh, kind of screenshot share. So a lot of users love to take screenshot screenshots and then share to their social media channels. And um, we have no tracking on uh, once users share that um, screenshot to another platform. We have no tracking of that, and their user have also have no way to come come back to our platform. So by kind of implementing this feature, it allows users to kind of easily. First, like reduce the friction to share a screenshot to social channels, but also kind of on the last um, screenshot you see, when users share a screenshot, they also get a link back. So whoever they share with can come back to um, Spotify and listen to that full song versus the image the user would have used to share. And then um, that just really wouldn't have that kind of um, loop experience that we um, were hoping we can provide to users who share and their audience who views that share. And then with this feature specifically, because um, we know that um, users previously did not have any way to come back to our platform. And also there wasn't like an, a better way for user to share screenshots. We just launched this feature with um, a hundred percent of our users right away um, without kind of doing A-B tests to see um, if it's going to kind of hurt any of our other metrics. And then I'm going to go quickly go over some like common strategies for launching new product features. Um, so I kind of mentioned a little bit employee only rollout. So it's low risk way to collect data, get feedback from employees, but sometimes the feedback might be biased. Um, there's an invite only rollout where you can kind of really control the size of users who are using your product. Um, and also um, you can maybe do some selection of the type of user you want to get. It's very similar to like limited user rollout um, where you can kind of restrict rollout to a specific user type. Um, for example, geography, if you want to only launch this product in the US um, or if you want to only launch this product um, for iOS 11, um, you can choose to do that too. There's a beta version, beta rollout, where um, it really helps set user expectation. Well, um, maybe the user who actually end up trying this are more willing to give you feedback. There's um, A-B test, I talked a little bit about that, that, and I think that's very commonly used nowadays. Um, there's gradual rollout, rolling out to 5% of users, 80%, 99%, just um, so that um, there's a period of like maybe uh, it helps with like bug discovery, helps with um, if you, um, if you 
there might be up maybe chances where things might go wrong. So it gives you a chance to not affect your entire user base. Um, and then there's also the full rollout, um, which is actually very common for product or experiences that requires um, all of their users to have that consistent experience. For example, um, uh, like if you want to launch like a chat um, in, your, in your app, you really have to launch it for all of your users um, so that they can communicate with each other. And then also other things to remember is to always set goals and track metrics um, and then communicate with your customers um, if it's a huge rollout and also create a long checklist of all your stakeholders, including legal, customer service, and public relations are ready for um, when the role happens and any aftermath that might, you know, might occur. Cool. So I'm done with my presentation. Um, happy to take any questions. Awesome. Thanks, Vaughn, for a great presentation, too. Um, guys, you can go ahead and start typing in your questions, too, so we can, um, we can get those going. Um, here. Hi. <laughs> um, let's see. We had a couple come in through um, Slack as well, too. Um, can you share some of the, yeah, can you share some of the books or resources that have been your favorite throughout your experience? In yeah. Um, so yeah, when I was um, interviewing, I really uh, liked cracking the PM interview. I thought that was like a very good outline of um, that PM interview process. And I think it does, depending on like which, I really like the fact that they separated it out. Um, um, I think uh, how, what a PM means in each company. So I think um, for a lot of people who are maybe looking to PM positions, it really, I think what the PM role is, it is a little bit different company by company. Um, so I think that really kind of outlines like maybe what you could expect at your work a little bit, but then more like broadly, if you're, if I'm just thinking about um, product in general, um, I really like the book um, Inspired. It's kind of the first book people um, um, read if they are interested in product management and understanding the difference between product managers, product marketing managers, and project managers. Mm -hmm. um, I also really like um, the blog put together by Intercom. Um, they have a lot of uh, very interesting, um, kind of just very up-to-date um, pra best practices of what they use in their company, but it's very, it's like short and sweet and also very up-to-date. So I really like just reading those blogs. Um, and recently, I think um, I was recommended by a podcast called Clearly Product. And it's actually, when you ask me like which book uh, I like, it's actually a really good podcast because um, each podcast talks about a helpful product books that you can uh, um, read, but also they summarize it in 30 minutes. So if you're like short on time, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> books, like, listening to that um, podcast, it's called Clearly Product. Okay, awesome. Um, thanks. And we had a, quite a few questions come in now. So I'm going to um, check here and see, um, <laughs> pick one of these. Um, here, so this one is from Keith. Um, what were some dates related to your timelines between each milestone and how did you come up with them? Yeah, I think the dates is really interesting because um, sometimes it's dictated by um, maybe in your, within your company, you have some deadline that you want to reach. Um, for example, um, with when I was at Sesame Street, there is um, certain like, like right before Christmas, um, we see a huge um, like boost in like number of apps downloaded, games bought. A lot of um, parents or like grandparents or caretakers they like to give apps as gifts now. Um, so we're really trying to uh, kind of hit that date for um, our like app, all of our iPad, iPhone. Um, Android basically device launches. Um, so sometimes it's dictated by that. Um, sometimes it's dictated by um, partners. Like when we were working with um, Chromecast to um, expand that uh, Sesame Street product to Chromecast, um, we were trying to hit their um, big announcement so that we get a lot of promotional opportunities um, through that. Um, so sometimes it's, it's dictated by a timeline by company or by your, um, opportunities and then you had to work backwards a little bit maybe you had to slim down your product a lot um, but always I think um, 
you should always build a minimum viable product. But then I think when you have a deadline, you're even more, even more pressure to do so. Um, other times, it's about hitting certain um, metrics. For example, when we were launching Amazon English, um, we did the um, invite only beta. And then we sent um, this invite to X number of users. And we said, until we get um, X number of subscriptions, we're not going to roll this out to um, the broader um, country. Um, so, and if we don't hit that number, we understand like, maybe there's just isn't a product market fit. So we need to make additional uh, feature improvements to um, in order to um, uh, hit that number and then we would feel, feel comfortable to kind of roll this product out to the broader country. Um, so it's a little hit or um, like a little different based on, I guess, situation. And then when you do a lot of tests, sometimes the test result will inform you um, whether this product will make sense or if you should revisit and go back to the iterative product development process to kind of start over um, and then make some changes. Yeah. Awesome. Um, this, uh, this next question is from John um, Tori. So what factors prompted Spotify to decide in investing in its sharing feature? Like was it user fe feedback or leadership? Um, if you can share that. And then furthermore, um, how do you and your team develop ideas and decide on which ones to start building and testing against? Yeah, um, sharing feature, I think, um, yeah, I think it just, it, I think even since Spotify, like before I joined Spotify, um, I think just sharing music, uh, like when the age when like people were like spamming on Facebook, like you know, a lot of like Zynga, like those games. I think that's that's kind of like when Spotify also started um, uh, in United States. And um, through a lot of these like sharing and music updates, we got a lot of new users. Um, so there is has always been like a history of how sharing on social platforms has led to a lot of um, users to uh, Spotify. So there's always already like this history of like investing in share, but then definitely we're doing a lot more these days, um, sharing music sharing and thinking about creative ways where we can share music. We see it as like a really great acquisition channel, but also engagement channel. And also we don't have a lot of like social features on our own platform. Like you can on the desktop, you can kind of see your friends feed what they're listening to. But we want to, we know music is kind of a, experience where people love to share with their friends and family. So we want right. to make it capable, available for users on the platforms that they're most, uh, that they use most, whether that's like Facebook or um, Twitter or something else. Yeah. And then um, another, the second question was like, how do we decide which one to invest in um, or to build? Um, yeah, I think it's always um, um, like challenging when you have a lot of different ideas or especially for our team, there are so many partners and apps that we can integrate with. Um, I think most of the time now we're really considering which um, platform will bring us um, the, most, um, the most users and how big is our platform. So maybe before we were very interested in trying um, um, like things out with like smaller, smaller, smaller apps and smaller partners, but now we just see the um, acquisition channel and the kind of the loop is much bigger and much meaningful to us as a company when the partner has a lot of existing um, uh, MAUs. Um, and I think it kind of translates into that funnel where if you start really big, um, then the user that it brings to you um, is a big number two in it. Awesome. Um, we have time for just uh, one last question. Um, this is from Tamvi. Could you speak to what product teams look like at Spotify and how do you influence your team to see uh, your vision or align with your product roadmap? Yeah, so at Spotify, the product team, um, um, it's, it's actually quite similar to um, what I would envision, like my experience in other, other um, companies. Um, it's pretty flat, um, it's very agile. I think one great thing about Spotify product team is that um, they try to keep everyone local. So that's like a really big bonus that your engineers, your designers um, are all with you. And we work in kind of a squad formation. So we are like one team, um, everyone, we have a dedicated, um, well, not always, sometimes we share resource too, but most of the time, if you're working on a project, you have a dedicated designer, you have dedicated engineers, and then um, you kind of aim to kind of launch a product 
Um, and then everyone is fairly involved um, from the ideation to kind of forming a user experience to kind of building. I think everyone's pretty involved. So that's like a really, I think it's a really good thing just so that you are not kind of in this, uh, you don't get tunnel vision into like right. ideas. Um, and um, and uh, I think another great thing is um, it, it, uh, sometimes most company nowadays use like agile, um, but um, I think Spotify also uses agile, but we are pretty um, quick to change the way we work if we notice something doesn't work. Um, for example, my team, we went by Scrum for like a good number of months when I first joined, but then um, the team just really had the feedback that they felt like it, the meeting was too heavy. And then we actually um, changed to Kanban, which uh, has a little bit less um, planning meetings and like um, kind of a lot of the process and procedure that are, are very common to Scrum. Um, so we went to that, but then um, I was talking to other product managers and we thought like, well, actually that became a little bit hard for us to have transparency in how they work. Um, so we are now suggesting maybe some kind of in-between method where we do a little bit more planning, but also keep, keep it like light so that um, they don't feel, the team doesn't feel restricted by that. Um, yeah, and I say it's, it's pretty flat. Um, um, and we have locations in like New York, in San Francisco, in Stockholm. And I think one great thing about Spotify is that we really encourage um, uh, the team to travel and learn from other teams. Um, so I had an opportunity to go to New York and Stockholm. I think that's always been helpful to um, feel like more connected to- like, Right, right. Uh, yeah. Absolutely, awesome. Um, well, thank you again for your time. Um, Really appreciate the presentation and, and taking the time to answer some questions. Um, before we let you go, could you share your final advice for aspiring product managers out there and those that are trying to break into the field? Yeah, I say um, try to figure out what your strengths are in terms of um, being a product manager. Because a lot of people say product manager is, is part of engineering, part of design, part of business. Um, I say try to find out like, um, I think it's impossible to for someone to say I'm good at all three. Um, trying to find out like what is your strength are. For me, I've um, just through working, I know that I am, uh, have a very good um, product like design sense. I have a um, I really enjoy like talking to users and understanding their user behavior. Um, so that's what I enjoy to do, enjoy doing, and then. Um, and then throughout the process, you can maybe figure out like if you're good at it or how you can improve on it. And then try to get into a role maybe that will play to your strength. So for example, if you are really good with numbers um, and you're very technical, maybe start a role in like data or um, engineering first if you can't get into a product. And then you can maybe slowly switch into that role. Like I, I mentioned for me that I started in business development first because I had a business background. Um, and then by being part of that and then also like kind of show that I have a lot of good product sense, I was able to kind of transition into that role. So I think um, a lot of times like starting, unless you get into like an internship or APM role, it's really hard to break into product. Um, I think getting into a role where you can play to your strength and then transition um, is a good strategy if going into product um, doesn't yield to like, the, the success you want right away. Yeah. Awesome. Um, well, well, thank you so much again. We appreciate you being here with us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you guys. Awesome. And thanks to, and thanks to everybody out there that was watching. Um, if you want more information about us, you can find it at productschool.com. Um, hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Bye guys. Bye.